Hey, so today we're going to try something slightly different from normal. We're doing a slightly shorter video uh, than normal. I'm, I'm testing out maybe doing slightly shorter videos between bigger projects that take more research. Uh, it's just so we're not, so the channel's not dead between then. So, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to do a quick wee video on housing, social reproduction and neoliberal subjects as a sort of colliery, 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 never learned how to produce, pronounce that word, as a colliery to the last video. Um, so this is going to be a bit more, a bit more blasting it camera, a bit less of my normal high quality production value than normal and a bit shorter. So without, the, without further ado, Let's uh, let's let's get started. So at the end of January, news emerged that rents in the UK had leapt up by 10.9% in London and 9.9% outside the capital, according to the website Rightmove. Um, and and this was in the the final quarter of 2021. There's a housing crisis tearing through the UK, and renters are facing an additional onslaught of a massive cost of living increase, which is forming a toxic combination. Like, I went to Sainsbury's the other day and bought like four things and it came to eight quid somehow. I don't know how that happened, it's insane. But landlords see this and just decide to squeeze some blood from stones. The housing crisis in the UK provides a window into not only the destructive impact of 40 years of neoliberal hegemony, but how that hegemony is reproduced and upheld. I am 100% certain that anyone watching this has at least one terrible landlord story, one story of a landlord acting not just immorally, like by being a landlord, but straight up illegally. And at the beginning of the pandemic, which was simultaneously 4,000 years ago and also somehow last week, uh, I find myself illegally evicted from the cupboard in which I lived in North London. Despite the fact that that was totally illegal, 100% illegal, I was evicted. But I was actually kind of lucky in several ways. And a good example of the precariousness which uh, defines life under neoliberalism, I'd found all my temp work cancelled at the start of the pandemic. Uh, 4,000 years ago. So I decided to, a smart move would be to go back up and visit my parents, uh, save some money, I assumed it'd be over in a few weeks. This, uh, this was the day before lockdown began, by the way, that, that, I'd, that I'd gone back to Scotland. I was, I was naive. I was a naive child back in 2019. Was it, no, 2020. 2020. Time is a flat circle. So I thought like I'd stay up there for a few weeks, I'd get work again once once everything started opening up again. But because of this, I was able to lean on my parents uh, when I received a text from my landlord saying that I was being evicted, casually saying that I was being evicted. Like, what am I supposed to do? I'm not there. Luckily, my sister lived nearby and was able to take my stuff for the 18 months that I ended up being kicked out of London. Um, but I could, spend thousands of words detailing and describing the various twists and turns of my eviction and my blatantly criminal landlord and you would likely be left feeling with some familiarity with, with similar situations and some cathartic rage. Like again, we all have terrible landlord stories but I think we can do better than rage. Uh, we can understand why and how housing has become such an essential site of struggle against the brand of neoliberal capitalism under which we're currently living. So we all know about the term neoliberal. Uh, I'm sure that you've come across it several times on this channel. We'll, we'll, we'll do a quick, a quick summary for anyone who's new. Welcome new person, this is the neoliberalism channel. You're gonna hear that word a lot if you stay, stick around here. Rather than simply a regime of laissez-faire free market capitalism with minimal state intervention and low state spending, neoliberalism is a system which seeks to reforge the state and the individual in the name of the market. That is, it seeks to use the state to create and uphold markets, uh, you know, like the housing market, 
uh, while simultaneously engaging in a process of creating individually responsible, entrepreneurial and atomized neoliberal subjects in a process that we can call subjectification. One of the key features of neoliberal capitalism which upholds both of these central goals is what I have come to start calling the privatization of the means of social reproduction. This refers to the privatization of the means through which labor power, individuals, families, workers, society as a whole, the social relations between capital and labor and capital and other different classes in society are reproduced. Uh, and this can take the obviously salient form of privatization of public housing, but can also take the form of like cuts to childcare or uh, after school clubs and reforming welfare to make it increasingly less accessible and more disciplinary. Markets like the housing market are supported while neoliberal subjects are being forced into being. So let's quickly talk about the ways that markets are supported and the subjectifying processes of housing privatization before looking beyond housing alone. Thatcher era reforms which privatized uh, social housing, privatized council housing, the provision of council housing and financialized mortgage markets has directly increased rents and housing costs while wages have risen far slower than housing costs because things can only get better. And these effects have been compounded by the fact that between 2000 and 2014, uh, the proportion of those private re privately renting uh, has doubled. And this is like a brief, 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 brief sketch um, at the changes in housing over the, the neoliberal era in the UK, but it indicates just how much more precarious housing has become in the neoliberal age. And indeed, in the first few months of the pandemic, over 227,000 renters fell into rent arrears. They fell into housing debt as many like me had their precarious work fall away. And these like trends in housing costs aren't just in the UK alone. Similar things are being replicated across at least, at the very least, um, Europe and the US and North America. So what makes this precariousness even more dangerous though is that in privatizing council homes, the state isn't just removing responsibility for the provision of housing out of its own hands, but moving it onto the shoulders of the private individual. This represents an essential part of neoliberalism, the attempted creation of a personally responsible political subject, one who can take a 9.9% .9 increase in rent in straight somehow, because we've all been getting 9.9% .9 increases in wages recently, I guess landlords have. They don't earn a wage though, they just steal them. If you're made homeless under neoliberalism, the responsibility lies directly with you, not with the landlord and definitely not with the state. It's, it's your fault and no one else's. So moving beyond housing to other examples of social reproductive privatization, how is a cut to an after school club or a reformation of welfare, uh, a privatization of this social reproduction? Well, rather than only farming out services to private companies, the neoliberal state also shifts the responsibility to maintain children or to maintain life in general from the state and onto the shoulders of the private individual. And in the case of childcare, in the case of most social reproductive labor, um, social reproductive activity, onto the shoulders of women. It's not the state's role to support the family, it's the mother's. And outside the household, women, and particularly racialized and migrant women, continue to be funneled into waged work within the social reproductive realm. That is within sectors like uh, healthcare, uh, care work and cleaning, uh, which have long been gendered and racialized. The figure of the female migrant cleaner is like a stereotype by this point. Such gendered uh, sectors have for a long time been sites of low low pay, but with the privatization and outsourcing of roles like hospital cleaning, wages have been driven down and labor often exported to migrant workers, while the precariousness of uh, those doing such work is increased. Patriarchy has therefore been reasserted in insidious ways under neoliberalism and the sharp increases of rent and housing costs caused by neoliberal policies have particularly dire consequences for racialized and gendered subjects. 
And on top of this, through this analysis of housing, we can also see how the precariousness and the, the precarious processes at work in neoliberal capitalism serve to uh, reproduce disability. This same privatisation and precariousness in housing isolates and atomizes disabled people whose access to homes is already constrained by a disabling society and an, an expulsion from um, the labour market. Um, and, and like, for example, the most accessible houses in the UK are or were council houses and with the privatisation of council houses a lot of this accessible housing is no longer accessible at all because it's expensive or it's been reformed, just destroyed. It's fucked. And as such, disabled people are often refused the ability to live in interdependence with their communities and with other disabled people and may face no other option but being expelled into increasingly costly and carceral care systems. And we can see how gender, race and disability are all recreated through neoliberal capitalist social relations. We can see both the disastrous effects of neoliberal housing and reveal its role in recreating the divisions in society upon which capitalism rests. So all this sort of theoretical stuff is relevant to my story about being evicted because I was obviously not the only person to be evicted by my criminal landlord. Um, in the brief period between my exodus to Scotland and our eviction, he'd moved in a migrant mother and her two children into this single room, a tiny single room in the house before evicting them with the rest of us. I don't want to gloss over this. A mother and two children, two teenagers, living in a tiny single room for a few weeks only to be illegally evicted during a global pandemic is a window into the tragic absurdity of housing under neoliberal capitalism. Seems like that would make Ebenezer Scrooge blush. Humbug. And through understanding the role of the privatisation of the means of social reproduction, we can see how a single mother caring for teenagers in a single room and evicted during the pandemic isn't is it, like it's not only made more likely by neoliberal capitalism and the often gendered and racialized precariousness produced by its privatization, but is in fact justified by it. If this mother can't take responsibility for providing housing and caring for her children, then it's she who's failed and not the state. It's she who has to change. And indeed, by keeping her close to destitution, the state is doing a good deed. It's teaching her responsibility. The, the peculiar sickness of neoliberal capitalism is revealed here. So the question then is what is to be done? And, and the usefulness of social reproduction theory and understanding neoliberalism is that it points to some of the most important areas of struggle, rather than like a myopic focus on the workplace or on the worker as, as this, the site of uh, anti-capitalist struggle, we can see that these sites of social reproduction, such as housing, are essential sites of resistance against precariousness, against neoliberalism and against capitalism. And we can see how um, racialized, gendered and disabling divisions are expressed. And I'm not the only person to have noticed this. Many, many people have. Uh, and you see increased activity from groups like ACORN, London Renters Union, who've used phrases like housing is a human right to articulate opposition to uh, the privatisation of housing, to the power of landlords and the increasingly authoritarian state which frequently uses police power to aid even illegal evictions. The police aren't on the side of the tenants, they're on the side of the landlords, obviously. So if housing is a human right then the neoliberal idea that housing is the responsibility of the, of the individual is turned completely on its head. The provision of housing is the responsibility of everyone, of, of society. And in fighting on the terrain of social reproduction, we not only find new opportunities of building class formation, but we expand the locations of anti-capitalist struggle beyond the narrow confines of the workplace, into the home, uh, into the community, into the very hearts of people's lives and the very heart of neoliberal capitalism. Rents increasing by record amounts and cost of living pushing us to breaking point, the need to organize against neoliberal capitalism has rarely been stronger. 
Oh yeah, okay. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for watching this quick wee video. If folk like this, then I'll maybe do it more. Uh, if not, I won't. But we'll see how it goes. Just wee shorter, more sort of bloggy videos that are less uh, produced overall. Yeah, so thanks particularly to Anita Enisipi, Elseren Agagost, Atterkop Atterkop, Daniel Hughes, Joel Kieran Gore, Niels Abildgaard, uh, Paul Singleton, Rachel Mixon, Rich, uh, Robin, Tamish Kispeter, uh, and Tinfoil Pancakes. See you next time where I'll hopefully have uh, a bigger, more sort of uh, academic uh, rather than bloggy video to put out next time. So, cheers. Um, bye, love you.